What's up, guys? Huh? <laughs> Happy Thursday. Hey, Ben did a good job, huh? That's right, man. Right on, Ben. So, guys, well, oh, yeah, next Thursday and the Thursday after, we're going to take a couple weeks off. So it'll be good, though. I think a lot of guys end up um, kind of getting together with the group leaders and you know, you guys can use that time to gather up and get into the Word, and um, I don't know, that's just, back in, back, way back in the day, we'd always go to a coffee shop or something, and we'd meet still, and just kind of, just stay in fellowship and go through the Word, so pray about it. I don't know, that'd be something cool to do, and then we'll resume right back after two weeks, and I think it'd be good, too. I think we're going to just kind of announce, too, in the main sanctuary about the men's ministry. Keep people, keep guys, you know, reminding them. The ministry and just kind of, you know, to get, get back into the groove of things. Some guys take a little break, and it's summertime and all, and so some guys take a little step back, but, you know, two weeks would be good. We used to take, how, how long was our breaks before? Like what? Four months? Yeah, three months sometimes. How many guys were around back then? Yeah, you remember those, those days? You get three months off during the men's ministry, man. Three or four months sometimes, yeah. <laughs> you know? So that was kind of interesting. Now we, don't, now we get two weeks, and it's been a, what, about five years. So we get two weeks after five years, guys. That's not bad. So, all right. I'm going to do something a little different tonight. Um, I know that uh, well, this is good, though, because, because most of you guys were praying have already read the Scripture. So that way, when you guys get into the group times, you guys could go over the Scripture reading and discuss what the Lord put on your heart during the week about it. So tonight, I'm going to read an entirely different scripture, all right, man? Something the Lord put on my heart, something I want to share with you guys, and I hope that you'll be ministered to by it, uh, but we can read it together, and in your group times, you can certainly discuss, hopefully, you know, talk about Genesis and what the Lord spoke to you about that. Um, I'm just a commentator, you know, so when I go over Genesis, it's really, I'm just commentating on it. You guys got the meat already, whatever the Lord spoke to you about during the week. I usually just kind of babble on about it and give you some more ideas. But tonight, I want to share with you something God placed on my heart, and it's found in Psalms, uh, the book of Psalms, of chapter 27. Uh, so will you join me in that? Psalms 27. And it was a word the Lord gave me today. And I thought, you know what? This is, I think, fitting for, for most of us. We're going to read the whole chapter. It's not that long. Only 14 verses. And we will cover all of them tonight. So this is going to be about a four and a half hour study. Um, so let's pray and let's, let's surrender everything ourselves to the Lord. Father, we thank you for this night. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your power and your intervention in our lives. And thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for us. And then we thank you for the second part to our salvation. That is you coming alive again and to live for us and to live through us. And Lord... All we could do is consent our will to your will. And all we can really do is surrender. Because sometimes we don't always know what we're surrendering. We're just fully saying, Lord, here I am. And sometimes we're not even saying, here I am, send me. We're just saying, here I am, deal with me. Here I am, help me. And so, Lord, uh, we want to hear and read and experience and more your victory, Lord, in our lives as we fight through this life and the struggles and the temptations and the enemy constantly beating on our, our minds and in our lives. And so, Lord, we pray your word would speak to us tonight, that your Holy Spirit would quicken the word, it would become living, Lord, and it would just penetrate in our hearts and in our minds and sit on our hearts and minds for the rest of the night, even as we sleep. And then when we wake up, we would start anew and afresh with more power from you, Lord. And so we know that Faith come by hearing, and hearing that of the word of God. So we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen our faith tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, Psalms chapter 27, a psalm of David, all right? And he starts off, and many of us know the psalm, so I think it's going to be cool that we're going through it together. He starts off by saying, the Lord is my light. I, and I'm going to stop there. Um, who is the Lord to us, you know? What, who, who is God? What has he become to us when, like David in the Psalms, are experiencing trial or experiencing 
something in our lives, of a situation. Um, the Lord, I, I, heard it, I heard that there's 52 different descriptions in the Bible of who the Lord is. And that's not considering those where it says, and God is, you know, God is love, God is... Just the Lord in, in himself, who the Lord is. There's 52 different things that he is mentioned in the scripture. And here David is saying he's his light. He's his light. And that's, that's interesting because it's in the darkness where David spent a lot of time. It was in the wilderness. It was in the night. David was a man who probably had a lot of sleepless nights. I think about David and I think about um, insomnia. I think about... Uh, stress, anxieties, de depression. I think about a man who was sometimes just in such turmoil in his life. There's scriptures that David wrote. That he says his bones were aching. He experienced just because of his some some were uh, due because of his mistakes. His you know he recognized his mistakes. Some were just because of affliction. Some was just because God was working on him, and he was learning how to be a shepherd. But interesting that to David, the Lord became his light. He illuminated the darkness. He illuminated those. God was his sort of that, that, that person to him that exposed things. He says, and he's my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. David starts this psalm by saying, this is who God is to me. He is light, he is a illumination, he is the revealer of my life, and he is the salvation to me. And I'm not just, we're not talking about, he's not talking about here like we, we're saved. That, oh, we got saved, so, you know, oh yeah, I'm saved. How we talk as Christians, we, it's a real common thing for us to say, I'm saved. No, he's talking about a, what, a daily position that the Lord is to him. He's his salvation daily, his savior daily, saving him from his as we're going to see as he describes his enemies in a minute, that, that God is his light and his savior daily. What does that mean? What, what is it that, how far and how, what stretch does a person have to go to see God as their light and salvation? What types of things do you think that God allowed to happen in David's life for him to understand the Lord in this way? What is the Lord to you? Is the Lord your light? Is he? How many of us have experienced the darkness? Whatever that means can be different for every one of us. Trial, affliction, uh, temptation, uh, uh, loneliness. And in those moments, who is the Lord to you, if anybody at all? Uh, what, what is, how does the Lord present himself to you? Because to David, he's his light and salvation. I'll tell you, sometimes to me, when I'm clouded and I'm struggling, the Lord is really not my light. I want him to be it, but I don't see it. And sometimes I don't see it, him even as my salvation. I sometimes think, well, the Lord is the great uh, tester, you know. I sometimes in my struggles, I have to say, the Lord is my tester. Because that's all I feel like. I'm just being tested right now. You know, and, and that's the truth. Sometimes you, you will experience that emotionally and you get into it. It's life. Oh, the Lord is the great clockmaker of my life, you know. That's who he is. It's like my life's like a clock, just so complicated. You know, the Lord is the great poker player. You know, he's just dealing me bad cards all the time. You know, who is the Lord to you? Who is he? Who have you seen him to be in your life? Because ultimately here, David, a man experienced in many trials, the Lord is his light and his salvation. He says then, whom shall I fear? Okay, now that scripture right there, man, if I could tap that thing on my chest, I would. Okay, the Lord, whom shall I fear? That's one of those scriptures that everybody wants to say, oh, bro, watch this, I'm a Christian. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear, bro? Well, I'll tell you, there's a lot to fear. And this fear that he's talking about, that fear, that word fear in this original text here means terror. Not, not like, oh, I'm afraid. He's talking, the word that, that is translated is translated from its form, meaning terror, uh, an extreme, ter a deep, deep fear, a deep terror, a deep, uh, the things nightmares are made of. The, the, and, and some of us are going to know this 
by the wickedness of the enemy. Now, that is deep. When your mind starts to go in a very dark place and your thoughts take you to a very fearful place where you're, you're experiencing the terror of the enemy, that's a whole other level of spiritual warfare. Paul knows that level. He talks about it. He talks about the battle of the flesh and the spirit. He talks about the wickedness in high places. Now, have we experienced that? Maybe some of us in here have. I know what it's like. Many of us in this room know what it's like to experience that, that warfare. In Can you imagine? Hey, Paul, the apostle, man, a pillar of the scripture. What is, what is warfare like to you? It's spiritual wickedness in high places. What does that even mean, man? What kind of high places are you talking about, bro? I'm talking about dark, high spiritual wickedness that creates fear and terror in a deep way, in a horrific way inside, internally. The one that, that causes, causes physiological effects, the fear that causes your, the nerves and the stomach to get messed up and the legs. And, and as David has written many times, his body to fail him. That's the kind of terror he's talking about. And he's saying, so in that moment, he's saying, He's learned that the Lord is light and the Lord is his salvation. So whom shall I fear? Who, who, could bring, who, who is going to really uh, create this terror in my life? The Lord is the strength, he says now, of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? So he's posing this question. Obviously posing this question from experience. And obviously it's one of those, hey, I'm going to pose this question, but I got the answer too. Because to him, here's who God has been to him. Before we get into describing really what the meat of what he's discussing here, he's starting it off by saying, let me just say this much. This is who God is. And that we have to take comfort in because that we have to say, this is who God is to us too. He will be. Let me rephrase that. Because some of us, I'm not going to lie. I, I, I want to be able to say, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength and my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I want to say that with great confidence. I one day will. I one day will. Just like David says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Look, guys, our Christian walk isn't going to be all figured out in the first week. It's not going to be figured out in the first year. It's, it's going to be something we're going to gain and learn lessons throughout life. Throughout experiencing heartache and trouble and sorrow and victory and excitement and joy. All those things are going to come through life. And so, David, I, I'm, I believe because God is the same, that one day I'll be saying the same thing. God is my strength. And I'll be able to minister to somebody going through it. And some of you guys could say that tonight. Some of you guys are there. You know God to be your strength. You know him to be your salvation and your light. You know it for a fact because you lived it. You're experiencing it. And some of us are going through it. And we believe it. Man, I want to write, like I said, I'll tap that on my chest. I want to, but you know what? I think I'm still learning it too. I'm still learning it. And it ain't over yet, man. My kids are young. Oh, gosh. I know I got a lot. Some of you guys got kids are older. You're like, just wait till they graduate, bro. Wait till they have babies, bro. Wait till they, you know, and it, and it just never ends. So for those of you who have kids that are in their 30s and 40s, hey, much respect, man. You guys have a lot of lessons going on there, you know. So, so I know these seasons of life, they come with these things, and we all, we're going to learn in these phases. And we're going to be able to say the same thing because though life is different and seasons change and circumstances are different, God is the same. He's the same. He is light. And I believe it. And he is salvation. And he is strength. And I know we all together believe it. So look what he says now in verse 2. Here he's going to get into it. When the wicked, okay, wicked, anytime you see wicked, it means Satan. When the wicked... Even my enemies and my foes come up to me to, look at to eat up my flesh. They stumbled and fell. All right, a couple things here that we have to point out about Satan. Number one, he's wicked. Let's just get past that. Dark, evil. So anything dark and evil and wicked taking place in our minds and in our thoughts, they're from Satan, the enemy, period. He is against you. Don't forget that. He's against me. Uh, he, uh, when he says eating up flesh, he's talking about kind of like sucking the life out of you. Just draining you. Okay, 
When's the last time you felt that? So, see, Satan is purposefully and actively attempting to suck the life out of you. If he could steal your joy, he will. If he could steal your peace, if he could steal your confidence your, in the Lord, if he could steal uh, uh, whatever, man, your knowledge you have about God, he'll steal it right after a Wednesday night. Steal it right after Sunday morning, on a Thursday night. He'll do whatever he can to suck the life out of you, to eat up your flesh. That's, we have to remember, that is what he will constantly and always do until the day we're home with the Lord. That's our enemy. That's his motive. That's his agenda. Uh, Look at, he says in verse 3, he, um, oh no, I'm sorry, same verse 2. He uh, came upon me to, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, verse 3. Though a host should encamp against me. So not only is he saying that he eats his flesh up, like sucks the life out of him, he's against him. He campaigns against you. He, he like they say, the, the angels encamp around us. Well, guess what? So does Satan. And, and, and his, his, they encamp around us. They, they work to uh, campaign against you on all sides. I mean, this is crazy, man. This is like, this turns our Christian walk into a war, all right? It, it turns the, oh, man, this is just such a cool place, dude, you know, walking with the Lord and all, to you come to this check that I think I'm in some kind of war here. And that's why I think Paul just fast-forwarded that and said, spiritual warfare, flesh against spirit every day. But we can't lessen this understanding. He encamps against you. And David's saying, that my enemy is so around me constantly trying to just wipe me out. And why? Because who was David? David had a calling on his life. He had a purpose given to him by God. He, he had to, God was going to use him in, in such a way to, to change history. See, God has a plan, as we know, for every one of us. We have a, that's why we're all here. We have, a, we have some type of calling in our lives, depending on who you're married to, who you work with, who your family is. God has a purpose for you, and the enemy hates it entirely, the whole entire thing, and is going to make war against you in every fashion that he can, using anybody he can. He says, my heart, though, shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. (laughs) So, war. Rising against you, the enemy sucking the life out of you, hating you, hating every spiritual thing about your life. And the war should rise, he says, the war should rise against me. In this, I will be confident. In what? In the Lord. In the first statement that he made. See, he experiences it. He's saying, look, I'm going to be, I've experienced the Lord being my light and being my salvation and my strength. How many of us in this room have experienced that before? We've experienced that. The Lord giving us strength, being our light, bringing salvation to us on a daily basis. See, it's in that that we have to be confident in. It's in, even if it's just in one moment of experiencing light or confidence, and maybe it's not every day, we have to remember God is the one that's going to bring salvation. That's our confidence. It's in that memorial stone of the day we were all saved. We talked about that recently, about the day you're delivered from yourself. That's a memorial stone. In that I'm confident. If God could take me from where I was before, he can do it again. Even in the middle of war now. See, the situation's changed. He says, now verse 4, check it out. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So, in the middle of war, In the middle of struggle, in the middle of him having this relationship with God and experiencing victory and putting his confidence in the Lord, he's saying, there is something, though, that I desire. And this is very important, I think, to our our spiritual walk. Though we're in the middle of war, though we're in the middle of trial, though we're in the middle of struggle, we still have to desire. And where is he saying that he wants to be? Now, a lot of us are going to say, I desire to be delivered from war. How about that? (laughs) Lord, how about that quick prayer? I'm in war, deliver me from war. That would be like me saying, I'm ill, deliver me from my illness. I'm going through it, Lord, deliver me from my trial. I'm experiencing this, Lord. That's the, 
I think that's what we all want to think it works that way. Like the genie, you know, rub the side of the thing. And Lord, my wish is to be delivered from any ailment and any frustrations that I have today. Well, does it work that way? Is, is, that, is that really God's design for us today? Does he use afflictions uh, just to go, psych, never mind, you're delivered. No, see, sorrow is greater than laughter because sorrow changes the countenance of the heart. That's what the Bible says. And it says that he chastens those he loves. So if we weren't being chastened, if we weren't experiencing sorrow, if we weren't experiencing these things, then we wouldn't change. God knows that that's what it does. So we, our prayer shouldn't be, well, Lord, deliver me right away from this trial. Or let me just drink this or pop this just to bring some ease and some, to relieve the pain and to, to bring some comfort. That's, see, the world has mastered how to get out of an uncomfortable situation immediately. But does that work? Of course not. Does drinking fix it entirely? Of course not. Does pill popping fix it? Of course not. In fact, a lot of times those things just make it worse. And we think drinking is going to help, but it's really a depressant. So it really makes it a lot worse uh, physically, too. But his prayer, his desire, is not necessarily just to be delivered from war. It's, he says, I will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. Now, what he's describing here in the contents of the writing is the temple. The holies of holies. He says, uh, to inquire in his temple, in the house, in the secret place. Now, us being Old Testament readers, we know what the holies of holies is. It's the place in the temple that only the high priest can go and make offering to the Lord. It's the very deep part of the temple. David's saying, in the middle of all this, Lord, if anything at all, in the middle of my trial, in the middle of the war, in the middle of what I'm experiencing, the wickedness, I just really desire to be in the sanctuary, in the holy place, in the quiet place of the sanctuary. The holies of holies in the Old Testament is a type of who? Jesus. He is the offering. He is the sacrifice. He is the holy. Okay? So what we're saying here is, look, in the middle of all this, really, is my desire to only be in the presence of the Lord? The Lord Jesus, is that my desire? When is the last time we found ourselves in the presence of the Lord? Even more interesting, you might want to find yourself in the presence of the Lord when you're going through trials, right? So boom, they work, don't they? See, the struggle, the affliction, the trial usually gets you to a place where you're desiring to be at peace and to be in the presence of Christ. It is. Trials do. That's what they do. They bring you on your knees and you go, okay, look, even if I don't get delivered then, Lord, even if I have to go through this, just be in, let me just be in your presence, man. That's all I want. David's saying the same thing. Just the only desire I do have, let me just be in the holies of holies with you, God. See, the arrows of his affliction are directing him to the right place. We have to be careful about that. That the arrows of our afflictions and trials don't direct us to the wrong place. Because <laughs> it sometimes does, right? Gets us into the weird thinking and all of a sudden you're doing weird things. And you're so far from God that now you're dependent on your doctor. And you're, you're, you're waiting for him outside his office. And, you know, you're pulling on his pants. Come here, give me one more doc, one more. You know, I need, need some more help. You know, we, we get ourselves into a place where now we're depending on something weird. Or a person even. You know, hey, man, that was real encouraging when you told me last week. I need to talk again. I need to talk again. And you're like, hey, man, whoa, whoa, man. See, that's good. That's all great fellowship. We need that stuff. But really, the first place we need to desire to be in these times of warfare and affliction is in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. Because it's personally. He, he, we have a personal relationship with him. And he wants every one of us in this room to be able to say that. To be able to say the one thing I have desired in this life and in this time is to be in the presence of the Lord. And if, look, man, and if we can't say that, oh, we will, eventually. We'll find ourselves at a place of going, that's what that means. To, be, to desire to be in the presence of the Lord. Now I know what it means. And now I know what it means not to, to just immediately say, deliver me from this evil, but rather, Lord, just the evil's going to be there. Just put me in your presence. How about that? How about that? 
The trouble's going to be there. You know what? Honestly, I think we can look around, guys, and find that this world ain't going to get any easier. And in fact, it ain't going to get any better either. And I think we could all look around and see that wickedness is increasing around us more and more every day. And it's getting closer to home every day. In fact, it's probably in some of our homes already. And we know that this world is going to continue to just get darker and darker. Up's going to be down. You know, left's going to be right. We, we see that happening already. So what do we say as men? Deliver me, Lord, from this evil, you know. Or, Lord, how about I just need to be in your presence? Because... <laughs> That ain't going to change. I remember as I was kind of going through some things, I, I seriously started thinking about, you know, the flight or fight thing. I thought, maybe I just need to leave, man. Maybe I need to just do what some other people I know are doing, you know, move to, you know, some state where you can buy a house for like five bucks, you know, with 10 acres of property and just, you know, raise my wife in a long dress, have my kids in little suits on, you know, and just eat off the land. You know what I'm saying? And teach the word to them for the next 20 years, you know, just my family only. <laughs> You know, and it's like, the Lord's like, yeah, you could do that, but you're going to bring your misery with you in your mind. It ain't going anywhere. It's up here. It's a peace that I can only give. And you can't run. You can't go to an island because you'll bring it with you because it's battle in a spiritual world in high places that you, you can't impact or affect. Only I can. And so in the middle of the city, gnarly, garbage, polluted, cars everywhere city, Yes, I could bring you peace. I could bring you salvation. I could be your strength. I could bring you sanctuary. Oh, but the enemy, he plays games, man. No, that's, you're not going to find it here. You, know, you got to go. Get out. See, but David, he's got it. Verse 5. For in the time of trouble, this is interesting. In these times of trouble, let me say, he shall hide me in his pavilion in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And there it is. In the secret. Now, this is one of those experiences that I pray probably many of us have already had or we're having now or going to have. Where you do find that you're in that secret place with the Lord. And that secret place, only you and the Lord know. Because for some of us, it's, it's in a car with the windows rolled up. You know, on a hot day with a heater on. <laughs> Some of us, it's on the couch. You know, everybody's sleeping. Some of us, it's in the backyard. Some of us, it's jogging. Where is it? Some of us, it's, it's just sitting there, man. Who knows? You might be one of those guys like, like me, just sitting on a bench at a park or something. I swear, I'm like 90 years old already, man. I could just look at birds fly all day. You know, and some of it, that's where it happens. But there's a secret place that only you and the Lord know. And it's sometimes a very dark place. And it's a very difficult place. Sorry. Ah. Sorry, guys. You like that cartoon? Get back in there. <laughs> I'm only sharing this because I told you this is something the Lord put on my heart. Because I go through it too. Uh, uh oh, Oscar, you got it. You got one in the tank, bro. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Sorry, guys. This isn't the Phil show. It's in those times where only you and the Lord know, and it, and and He's there, and He brings you to that place where it's just you and Him, and it's it's that secret place where. Where he says, this is where I'm going to meet you. This is where you're going to find me. Thanks. This, this is where you're going to find me in the middle of all this. In the middle of this darkness. This is where we're going to meet. And you know what? You never forget that place. <laughs> and, and he brings you there, though, to meet you, to speak to you, to minister to you. So David could say, you're my light. And you're my salvation. And you're my strength. See, that's what happens in that secret place. That's what happens in that moment. Because no matter what's happening, you're able to say, gosh, man, the Lord is my light. He is my strength. And so look, verse uh, 6. 
And now, he says, shall my head be lifted up above my enemies. Because that's what happens, victory. And around about me. Therefore, now after the victory, see, when you have those moments, when your head is lifted up high, because it's going to happen, guys. <laughs> it will happen. He will lift your head high. It might be for a moment, because you might go right back into the war 10 minutes later <laughs> or the next day, but he will lift your head high. And when that happens, look what David says. Uh, Therefore, I will offer in, this tab in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. See, what he's saying is, when, that, when I do experience that uplifting moment, that's when I praise the Lord and I give thanks. And guys, even if it's just for a moment, even if it's just for a day or a night, it's still a moment worthy to sing praises to the Lord. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because when you're in the dark place, it feels consuming. And the Lord says, no, I'm going to give you light right now. I'm going to be your salvation. And that's that time where we say, we don't sit there and then just start resuming as usual. <laughs> no, God wants us to get to a place where, like, uh, you're driving your bike, you know, and you're just like, oh, this is so awesome. The breeze is hitting your ears or whatever. This, thank you, Lord, for this moment. You know, yeah, it might be a little overdramatic, but you know, that's what he wants you to do. Because you have now, you get to see what life is then, you know. You get to see those moments of, of having this peace, of saying, man, you know, life sucks, it might, but God is good. And there's going to be times where I say, man, thank you, Lord, for just this moment. Just this, uh, this moment to spend with my kids. This moment to spend with my wife. This moment to spend at church with my bros or whatever. You know, do we appreciate these things? And I think God uses, as we see with David, all of this stuff so that way we can begin to appreciate these things. Because he wants us to be a people of thanks and a people of praise and a people who appreciate those types of things. Because the flip side to it is you become a person who is just so busy or so moving quick and fast and consumed that you don't even appreciate a, a, a nice afternoon anymore. Because life is consuming and the war is consuming and drowning out everything that God wants you to give jo be joyful about. And that's what trials do. That's what they do. So hear, O Lord, verse 7, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou sayest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. You know, some, I heard it said, when you're looking, what does it mean to seek someone's face? We don't do that. You know, I seek your face, man. You know, what does that mean? Uh, you know, the good example of it is when you're looking at a picture and you look for yourself because that's who you look for first. Uh, you're looking for your face. You're looking for, for the person in it. You, you seek someone's face. Um, but really, when you're looking at somebody eye to eye, you're, you're really, that's where you're at. You're looking at their eyes. And I think in these moments, we really seek out to see if the Lord is watching us, to see if he is looking. We seek his face to see if his eyes are upon us to see if he cares about what we're going through, then if he cares about what we're experiencing. And that's where we see, look at verse 9. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God, O God of my salvation. See, when, oh, he says, verse 10, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. He's saying, David's experiencing, he met eye to eye with God. In that sense, that spiritual sense, that in these times, and he sought the Lord, yes, the Lord met him. The Lord's eyes were upon him. And if God's eyes are upon you, then what else should we worry about? What else can, what else, if God, you know, but that's hard. The enemy will lie to you. And because and, think about it. There's a lot of people on this earth, and sometimes I think, oh, God, you're doing something with somebody else far more serious than me, just over here tripping out. <laughs> but no, he says, no. If you seek me, I'm watching. I'm with you. So, teach me, verse 11, thy way, O Lord, and lead me in the plain path because of my enemies. Now, that's interesting. Teach me because of my enemies. Teach me, Lord, your ways. Lead me, Lord, because of my enemies. What does he say? He's saying, Lord, I want to learn lessons, and then I want to be directed because of the enemy, because of the affliction, because of the war. Because of the trial. See, David got it. Those things teach you. 
They're there to lead you. That's why God allows them. He allows the things that are awkward and uncomfortable and, and suspicious to Christianity to happen because they will teach us. And they're going to lead us into the right path because of the enemies. That's that, that's that biblical saying, you know, what, uh, or there's a scripture that says, what Satan meant for evil, God turned around and used for good. Joseph said it. That's that right there. All these things that might seem to be evil or wrong or frustrating or confusing, Lord, then teach me through it. Direct me through it because that's what God wants to do. Because he wants to use them to teach us. Because the enemy. Deliver me not un over unto the will of my enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. And what David is saying there, there's liars, Lord. They're lying. And guess what? Uh, Satan, he's a liar. And I'll tell you what, any chance he gets, especially during affliction or trial, oh, he's going to lie to you, big time. I mean, I'm talking create things that are unheard of. You're going to be thinking things that are bizarre. You're going to be hearing stuff in your mind that, that you're like, what the heck? Why did it, what? what? You know, like, what movie was I watching? You know, like, why, why all of a sudden am I thinking this crazy gnarliness? Well, because they're lies. That's why. It's not you, man. <laughs> it's the enemy lying to you. He, he, he's the master of it. He, he, that's what he's, that's his specialty. I'm going to bring such great confusion in their minds because I'm going to lie to them. I'm going to lie to them. Verse 13, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of living. You know what? Same here. I think we would all have fainted. We would all have given up. We would have all thrown in the towel unless we believe. And that's why earlier in the prayer, uh, believe comes by faith. You know, and faith come, comes by hearing the word of God. See, unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of living. Don't give up hope. You can't. You don't give up. Because that's what the enemy wants you to do. But this is what you say. <laughs> you say, you know what? I might be all messed up. I might be failing. I might be struggling. I might be going through whatever. I don't know what it might be. Maybe you know somebody who is. Maybe this isn't you tonight. Maybe you know someone who is. But you just tell them this. You say, look, you might want to give up, but you keep going. You don't stop. Because unless he had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of living, he had fainted. You will. If you don't, if you, if you stop, if you let the war, if you let the pressures, if you let the oppression, if you let the lies get you and you stop, yes, you will stop. You will have fainted. But he's saying, no, you got to believe this. What we're reading here takes an, an element of faith to believe that God is light and salvation. And that's why I said earlier, I will say that. I don't know how old I'll be. You know, I, I will say that one day. You know, I was talking to my son. He has a little, he's a little fireball. He doesn't know how to control his emotions. And I'm sitting there telling him, you know, hey, it's the, it's the enemy. And it was really the first time I had like a kind of like a real spiritual conversation with my son. You know, I always teach them and read with them and all that. But I was like sitting there talking to him. I was like talking to myself. I'm like, don't worry, son. Like, uh, this is, Jesus wants to live through you, son. And, and, and this is just what you're going through in your mind. And, and you got to learn how to let the Lord say, and I, and I find myself talking to myself while I'm talking to him. And he's looking at me like, yeah, yeah. Like, well, like this is getting real weird, dad. You know, like, <laughs> but, I, but I'm sharing this with him. And I, you know, prayed with him and I let him pray. And at you know, first he didn't want to, but then he did. Um, but it's, son, just know, like, we believe this. We believe that God is going to be victorious. And God's going to help you with your anger because he's real angry. And your emotions. And, you know, he doesn't know why he has those things. I don't know why I'm so angry, Dad, and mad at everybody. Um, but it's believing. It's believing that he will. And that's what we got to have. And you may not believe it. You may not have it totally like, oh, yeah, I believe it just because it's written. I don't necessarily believe it because I've experienced it. There's a difference. I, you know, I, I have not really, well, I take that back. There's been many times in my life I experienced the victory of the Lord and, and the freedoms of God, obviously. I'm still here, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but some of it, I haven't experienced it fully, but I believe I will. I, I haven't experienced some of the testimonies I hear from people, man, like Pastor Jeff. He's got testimonies for everything. You know, stories about even dead, his nephew dying, coming to life. Jeff's got a, a story for everything, and I'm like, I know eventually I'll be there. You know, I'll have my, my testimonies, and I, but I believe it. I believe it, and that's what we have to have. We have to believe it, guys. 
No, so last verse, and this is the really cool one. It says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. That word wait means to fasten yourself. That's what it means. He's saying, fasten yourself, stand firm, wait. Now, why is he saying that? Here's this whole Psalms about Jesus, about God being light and life and strength and warfare and all these different things that he's experiencing. And he ends it by saying, wait. Because David knew that when he's experiencing all this stuff, when he's because David would go through this more after this, uh, that the key to this all, man, the, the, the key to it is you have to wait for the Lord. You have to wait for him to show up. You have to wait for him to, you have to fasten yourself tight for him to show up to revive your heart. And he says it twice. So wait, I say, on the Lord. So fasten yourself. Because he knew, and, he, and the Lord knew to put the scripture in it because he's saying, if you don't wait, you're going to get impatient. And you're going to be going, where's the Lord? Blah, blah, blah. I thought all this light and strength. And yeah, I get the warfare and the struggle and all that stuff, man. And I'm going through the secret. I want the secret place too. But it's not happening right now. Well, well wait for the Lord. Wait. That's, that's the daily application right there. Well, you know, man, well, that, that's cool for you, Phil. You seem like you do No, no, no. We have to wait. That's what David is saying. He's ending it by telling us all this is true. Warfare, evil, wickedness. The same as Jesus and the Lord being our strength, our Savior, the secret. He's saying all this is true, but no, there's going to be one major attack that you're going to have to really do because the other one is impatience. And it means he's saying the other one is going to be you're not going to be able to wait for God. You're going to be looking for him. You're going to be looking for that victory. You're going to be looking for that deliverer. You're going to be looking for that peace. And it may not show up that night or that day or at that moment or at that time. It may not meet you there. But wait for it. Wait. Wait for the Lord. Wait for God to show up. You have, see, we have to be able to say, Lord, I, I don't feel it. I don't see it. I'm not experiencing But you know what? Okay, I'll receive that. I'll wait. I'll wait. Because the word says is if I wait, then he's going to strengthen my heart if I wait. So we have to pray. We have to say, Lord, then, then in the middle of all these things, in the middle of all this, then, Lord, uh, I may not understand it all. But the one thing I'll take from this, Lord, is it, I'll wait. Because eventually I know I'll be saying the same thing. Though I walked through the valley of the shadow of death. Already passed. He saw it. He walked through it already. Though he is, eventually all of us in this room will be able to say, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? We'll all be able to say it. We just need to wait on him through these times and through these situations and through these trials. Because he'll show up. He's faithful. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, and thank you for uh, the trials, Lord, and all the different things that you allow us to go through. But, Lord, thank you for the truth of the word and how it reveals and it exposes the enemy, our hearts. Um, and, Lord, like, like we're reading here in the Psalms, um, one thing we desire, that is to be with you, Lord, to find that sanctuary, uh, to behold, Lord, that beauty. And, Lord, to be able to say, um, bring us into that secret place. And, and then, Lord, uh, we want to say even in that, uh, in everything that this life might be bringing to us or to somebody we know, to wait, to be patient, to hold fast, to, to, st to stay our ground and to wait to see you, Lord, because your word says that that's what you do and that you're faithful to meet us and you're faithful to deliver. You are the light. And, Lord, we, we seek that. And so, Lord, we desire you. We desire to be in your presence. And so we thank you, Lord, for this night. And we pray, Lord, that in our group times it would be fruitful, Lord, reflecting the things of the Scripture. Continue to just pour into us more tonight the things of your word, Lord, that we can walk out of here strengthened. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless, guys.